Good morning. Thanks for sticking through to this. I'm the last one before the break. Um, and today I want to talk to you uh, a little bit about trying to gain control of your networks and reducing the impact or the chance of, of ransomware. Um, every good cyber security presentation deserves a quote. Um, so I went to the great philosopher um, Sylvester Stallone and pulled out this quote from the first Rocky movie. I think this works quite well with cyber resilience. It's, you know, it ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit. And when we think about the mitigation and the tools that we're putting in place in cybersecurity, we can put our, our DDoS protections in, our WAF protections in, but if they're not allowing us to move forward, then we're just staying still. And the idea is that we need to build our solutions. We need to build our access, our data, our apps in a resilient way that allows us to succeed in spite of the challenges that are thrown at us. So I want to talk about the, the ransomware kill chain a little bit. And there's, there's various ways of deploying this and describing this. But there's various this bits here. We talk about the, the initial infection, the lateral movement, and the impact. So I want to sort of bring out those three areas. Because these are sort of three things where we can certainly have the most visibility, the most um, opportunity to be able to protect against that. So if you look at the first one, the, the uh, initial access part, there is a whole genre of cyber criminal whose job is just to do this initial part. These are called access brokers. These guys just do access brokers. All they do is find ways into your network. Once they're done, they're just going to sell it. Now, they can do it in a various different ways. They can do it through phishing. They can do it through account takeover, dodgy passwords, that sort of stuff. Or they can even go after disgruntled employees. Checking anybody whinging on Twitter or LinkedIn is always a good place for them to start. Then we got things like lateral movement. We learned a lot about how criminals do lateral movement, especially within ransomware, when Conti, who was a very prolific ransomware group a couple of years ago, dropped all of their tools, techniques, procedures, etc., online after a disagreement over Russia invading Ukraine. But what was interesting was when Conti dropped all that information, there wasn't a huge amount of unique code that was being used. The tools and techniques that we're using was standard stuff that had been around for years. What Conti did is they gave everybody, they gave all of their operatives a how-to guide, a how to hack a network. And it literally was step one, go and do, you know, run Mimikatz, get all of the information of the logged in users and the accounts that are in line. Then maybe use Kerberos to get rid of get some of the passwords in clear text. Standard tools that have been around. There wasn't anything new. The only bit that they had that was unique was the re-encryption part. Everything else was standard tooling. And then the last part was the impact. So we've got the opportunity where a lot of attackers now are exfiltrating the data, stealing data so they can keep it for later. But there's also the impact of uh, encryption, lo locking all your machines up, or coming in with a, what they call a triple play or a quad play. The triple play, encrypt, exfiltrate, and then DDoS you. So it really is sort of laying into you with more punches when you're down. Or even quad play, which is, which is used by some organizations, where they do all of those three, and then they come in with the, the public humiliation as well. So these are the three, the three areas that we sort of want to sort of focus on. And we look at those act, initial access, going back to that sort of linchpin one we call initial infection. We talked about the initial access brokers there's also the way of accessing in through your attack surface, what you present to the internet. And this graph here shows the attacks that, that Akamai saw um, sort of going from the last sort of couple of years. So June 2021 over there on the left. That was a sort of typical month we were seeing, about a billion attacks a month. You can see that the most, the biggest bar there is in orange. That's a SQL injection attack. And then probably most people have heard of it, an SQL injection attack. This is an attack that is my, my first hack.com sort of thing. It's like everybody knows how to do an I, a SQL text attack. It's the first thing people learn. It's very easy to do. Look for a, a website that has some form field in there, and you can play around with it. It's very easy to learn. This is why it's been the most dominant attack vector for years. Not anymore. As you can see, if we scroll through to January this year, the number of attacks has gone up. We're now just sort of shy of 6 billion a month. 
But the dominant attack vector is this one here. Moved away from sequel injection, it's now what's called LFI. And why is that? Sequel injection attacks were great. They allowed you to maybe get some usernames, maybe get some passwords from the edge of your network. But it didn't allow you to get much more. Nowadays, the focus is ransomware. They want to get inside your network. And local file inclusion is the way to get inside your network. And this pivot, this shift in the attack vectors is something we need to keep an eye on. If we look at the lateral movement processes, we sort of we talked about Conti before. Obviously, they broke up, and then we had uh, Lockbit filled the void. And obviously, after some great work with uh, the NCA uh, and the FBI, we managed to take down that infrastructure just recently, um, which is a great story. But now you've also got actors like Rysider, uh, who were responsible for the British Library attack that we've probably seen lost in the news. By the way, if you haven't read the report on the British Library, they've done an excellent uh, review of exactly what happened within that attack. They haven't got a smoking gun yet of how they got in. They think it was through a, through a terminal server with no MFA. So it's, you know, it's not, not a huge surprise. But they did do a very good report on actually what they did. They had good processes to invoke their teams. Um, they had good pr uh, processes to involve their management. Um, they had to resort to WhatsApp because that was the only out-of-band tool they had. It's an interesting thought to think about what happens when you do get ransomware. What happens when, that hap when you have that situation where you can't go to SharePoint and find out what to do next? Some conversations of how do we see those, they said we have a grab bag. It basically has a, a printout of what to call all the phone numbers, because you're never going to remember. Who remembers phone numbers now? You're never going to remember the phone number. So you have the list of phone numbers of who to call, the processes you want to do, a mobile phone that isn't connected to the corporate network, preferably an old school or non-smartphone, and then chocolate bars, because you're going to be up for a long time. You need food. And then a couple of bits of data about this. This is taken from the Conti attack group, just to give you an idea of the effects that they were doing, where they were aiming. So UK was the most attacked region in EMEA. Yay, we're good at something. The other bit was, this was the interesting bit. You'd expect ransomware operators to go after the big companies. That's where you're going to get the most value from. This is the most, it's the smaller companies. It's the ones that haven't got that dedicated security function that maybe you've got the IT team are wearing two different hats. This is where the most successful. And this is where the concern needs to be in trying to focus on where can we protect this as much as possible. So going back to those ideas around initial infection, I've got a couple of numbers I want to share with you. So at Akamai, we see a big chunk of the internet every day. So approximately 7 trillion DNS queries every single day. And we looked at this, and it allows us to see where a lot of the internet traffic is going. So we can look at traffic that's going to malware sites or phishing sites or command and control sites. And command and control site, that's the interesting one. A command and control site is what's called an indicator of comp compromise. We can see something inside a network that is talking out to a piece of malware. So it's finding out what to do next. When we looked at all the, the machines that were talking out of all those 7 trillion requests, finding out which ones were talking out to a malware site, a phishing site, or a command and control site, one in five were talking out once a quarter, at least once a quarter, one in five devices. When we slice and dice that a bit more, and they said, okay, let's find out how many organizations are just have devices that are talking to command and control, so i.e. an indicator of compromise, indicator of a breach, one in eight. So that was basically saying that one in eight organizations have potentially been breached. So when we say, have you been breached yet, this is not being facetious or trying to be scary. It's just that there's a good chance that something got inside the network already and is communicating out. It might be benign. It might not be. So there's an argument say, well, should we assume breach? Again, not being fatalistic, not being dramatic. It's just like we want to try and turn the concept of a breach from a career-defining event to a trivial event. And that's why we wanted to make it. Because we can do that. We can get it to the point where we can, we can reduce that risk. So if we assume breach, we can start thinking, OK, where is the important part of my network? Where is the data that I need to focus on? Where is the stuff that I can say, OK, if that gets 
that gets infected, that's fine. I'm just going to burn that lot and rebuild it from scratch. It won't take me, take me five minutes. What is the stuff where if that goes, we may as well block the doors and throw away the keys because we can't carry on. It allows us to focus on what are our crown jewels. And the reason I put this picture up is because I'm sure everybody's seen a movie with a submarine at some point. And at some point, there's always going to be a part where lots of klaxons go off, lots of sirens goes off, and water starts coming in, or smoke starts coming in. And the next thing you always see is lots of submariners running around the boat, frantically closing the bulkheads, securing those bulkheads. And what is it they're trying to do? Well, a submarine, if you don't secure those bulkheads, if you don't compartmentalize the problem into the smallest possible area, bad things happen quickly. So the idea is if you can compartmentalize that, that breach, that hull breach with the water coming into the smallest possible area, you can surface the boat, get back home, and everybody's safe. And that's what we want to try and do with our networks. We want to segment our networks. Because segmenting our networks allows us to compartmentalize that breach into the smallest possible area and make it a trivial event. So segmenting networks is easy, isn't it? Because everybody's got a nice, easy network. Everything's nicely mapped out. I know it's not Ethernet, but you know what I mean. Um, but the idea is if we can figure that out. We can put, put some firewalls in here, and we can segment our network. That's probably realistically what most networks look like. And that's why segmenting is hard. So what we need to do is we need to do it not at the network level, but do it at the workload level. This allows us to take advantage of our fluid networks that are moving between the cloud and our data centers, that are moving between our hosting providers or moving as a function. This allows us to take advantage of that so we can sort of have that segmentation done at the workload. And this is how we can do it, because when you're thinking about segmentation at the workload, this isn't reinventing the wheel. This is just moving the control. So we can do it as a firewall rule. So the idea is, is that when you look at that lateral movement we talked about, that middle one, that red one we had in that middle of that, that kill chain, the tools that we're using to do lateral movement is SSH. Yeah, it's using things like RDP, WinRM, all of these standard tools. But why, why do we have those on our network? Why can't we just block them across the entire network, but only allow them from where we need it? So SSH, everybody needs to use SSH from an admin perspective but it's normally enabled by default. So we can just block it by default and then say, yeah, if you remember the IT team, AD directory, or you know, from the financial applications, we want to allow that from that device to this device on this port. So now we're looking at doing it from least privilege. You can reduce these common tools that are used to do lateral movement and immediately apply least privilege across your entire estate. And it doesn't matter where that workload moves to. If that workload moved from an on-prem to a hosting center to the cloud, the policy moves with it. So you don't have to re-cable, rewire, refunction, do anything. It just moves with it. If you look at it you know, from the remote desktop protocol, again, the same thing. Or the remote desktop protocol, it's really the ransomware distribution protocol because it's more effective at doing that than it is at providing remote desktops. Um, but this, again, it's the same thing. It's you block RDP across your estate, and then you allow, from based upon the, uh, the AD group, to whatever server you're going to. But then you can start giving it more granular rules into well, you know, which particular programs do you want to allow on that RDP session? What particular destination do you want to go to? So you can go into a very granular level without having to, to compromise the integrity of the network. So I think I've got my last five seconds. This is before Sarah. Oh, an extra minute. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want, I've got a couple of QR codes here. I have tested these this morning. They're completely genuine. They will bypass the, pay, the, um, the gating documents, all that sort of stuff. So this is a, um, a document that allows you to look at the app and API protection solutions that, that Akamai has. And this one is all about ransomware. Uh, good, uh, some really good search reports. Akamai does regular state of the internet reports. We see a third of the internet every day, gives us a fantastic amount of first party data. We are going to be producing another one in, uh, on API protection uh, next month. So do uh, check an eye, to keep an eye on the website for that because it is going to be very interesting. Um, with that, I wanted to finish you up by taking you back to the beginning. Um, 
if we understand and sort of monitor things like the outbound DNS, but more functionally, leverage tools such as micro-segmentation, which gives us that visibility, which gives us that ability to do least privilege at the workload, we can be in a far better position to, to take the punches, but to be dynamic, to keep moving forward. Thank you.